questions? Right? What was the last time? What was the last thing we were talking about? What was Paul talking about? Practical living in the Christian life, right? Good morning, people. Have a good day. I'm telling my race here. They'll get upset. What were some of the things Paul was telling us to do? You can look at your Bible if you want. What did he say? Do what? He's, t- he's using the metaphor of what? Taking something off, putting something on, right? Right? Yes, correct. But uh, what was one of the things you said to put off? Stop doing what? Anger. Anger. Stop being angry. Anger. What else? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Right? What else? Slander. What is slandering? Right? Isn't there a commandment about that? Don't lie on your neighbor. What else? Malice. Malice? Which is what? <laughs> Good. He's continuing in the, in the practical thing <laughs> of the Word, right? Now in this lesson, uh, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17 in Colossians, um, he continues with the same he continues in the same theme, but when he says put off, now he's saying to put on, right? So put those things off once and for all. Remember, it's a once and for all thing, right? It, it you should do it once and then it should be done with. Okay. Sometimes we find ourselves falling and rolling back into the same old clothes that we had on, right? Amen? Anybody else? But now he says Put on these things, okay? Let's start in verse 12, chapter 3. He says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, okay? You are the elect of God. Remember that because you're chosen before the foundation of the world. Don't forget. Remember, there's there's both this and that, okay? There's both we chose Him and before we even knew of Him, He chose us, okay? just has to do with the fact that God is outside of time and we are bound by time and space, okay? Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, what does he say? Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. So he starts out by saying, put on these things. You took off those other things, I told you, right? Stop being angry. Don't blaspheme anymore. Don't slander. Malice. Throw those things off once and for all. Now, in place of those things, put on these, okay? Tender mercies. Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Okay, it's not an exhaustive list, but Paul's going through some things that are at the forefront of his mind, right? And then he says, now do this with one another. Bear with one another. Or he says, bearing with one another. Okay, a continuous act. And forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as... Let me back up and read it in context. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a complaint against another. Okay, in other words, be patient with each other, okay? Right? We all screw up. Let's just accept it for what it is. Let's try not to screw up as much as we used to, right? If you know you did something wrong yesterday, be better today, right? Amen? And bear with one another, right? Because what do you have that you haven't been given, right? Why should I not forgive Dave, okay? When Christ forgave me. That makes sense? So bear with one another. He says, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. Verse 14, but above all things, or above all these things, put on love, okay, which is the bond of perfection. Love is like the girdle, okay, or the belt that holds all these things together, okay? Holds all what things together? Tender mercies. Kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Around those things that hold them up is what? Love, right? And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, in or to which also you were called 
in one body and be thankful. Okay, the peace of God, let it rule in your hearts. That's what you were called to, Paul says. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through him. In other words, do it so that Lord, the Lord Jesus shall be exalted and seen. Amen? All right, Wiersbe says this in his opening statements. He says, This section completes Paul's exhortation to the Christian to live a holy life. It continues the illustration of what? Of garments. He says, hence the putting off and then the putting on. Okay, Colossians 3, 8 through 10, we just read about that. He exhorted his readers to put off the grave clothes of sin in the old life and to put on the grace clothes of holiness and the new life in Christ. The emphasis in this section is on motives. Why should we put off the old deeds and put on the qualities of the new life? Why? Paul explained four motives that ought to encourage us to walk in the newness of life. Let me give you those four things. One. First motive is the grace. Grace of Christ. Okay? The second is the peace of Christ. Okay? The third is the word. And the fourth is the name. Word. Right, like my kids. And the name. Four motives as to why we should do what Paul tells us to do. Throw off the old ways, right? Stop being angry with each other. Start being patient with each other, right? Number one, the grace of Christ. Again, what do we have that we haven't been given? Okay? The peace of Christ rules or should rule within our hearts. The word of Christ we have and it will never change. Amen? In the name of Christ. These are the four motives that Paul reaches out to. Now, one question I want to ask and I want some feedback from you guys. Has anybody been through this stage of their life? Continuously going through it, I guess you would say, but is there anybody in here who is willing to say, I remember when the Lord told me or showed me, stop doing that and start doing this? Anybody? We can't move on until I get two examples. Anybody used to be a slanderer? Anybody used to be easily get angry with somebody? Oh, yes. Okay. Has the Lord worked through that with you? Still working. Okay. I was very, very angry at my younger brother Away and told him he didn't know what things were going to be. He started paying us back. All right, guys. No worries. Good. Good. Yeah. What'd you replace it with? Yeah. Does it ever come back to you? Like, is it ever, is it ever something that. Yeah. Good, good. Still working on it? Oh, yeah. I work, I work on being angry. But, um, brings back a lot of my childhood, my childhood um, confrontations with people in my family. Um, it would be, it would be nothing for me to go, you know, be real, real calm and go from zero to 150 seconds. Yeah. And I'm, I'm better now, especially when we, when we had children. I'm more patient now than I was back when I was 21 years old, 18 years old, even younger than that. Yeah. But I'm still working on a lot of anger issues. Amen. But it's, it's still there, but it's, it's better when it used to be. Nice. Very good. So again, 
the four motives as to why we should put off the old clothes that Paul is talking about and put on these new things. The grace of Christ, the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and the name of Christ. All right, the grace of Christ, Wiersbe goes on to elaborate. He says, grace is God's favor to undeserving sinners. Amen? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, right? Paul reminded the Colossians of what God's grace had done for them. One, God chose them. The word elect means chosen of God. God's words to Israel through Moses help us to understand the meaning of salvation by grace. The Lord did not set His love upon you. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, 7 and 8. And he says, or Moses tells the children of Israel, he says, The Lord did not set His love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, hath the Lord brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. In other words, it wasn't because of anything great that we've done. God chose to love us, and that's why He loves us. Amen? You can't really reach into your life and find any reason as to why we should be given such great grace. And uh, when you really sit, when you sit down and really think over and chew through that, it'll blow your mind. At least it should, anyway. Okay? Let me give you these A, B, and C, and D, okay? Before uh, we read about them. God chose them. If you hadn't already wrote that down, God chose them. Okay? God set them apart, or He sets us apart. God set them apart. He loves them. And God has forgiven them. Forgiven them. Okay? Then He goes in. I'll just go ahead and give you these two. Then He goes in to tell us what it is that we ought to be putting on. Okay? As opposed to what we used to wear, He says, put on tender mercies okay put on kindness you, you can think about that uh like not having a terrible resting face when you go into a public place right everybody always man what are you okay are you mad or what no, is, i'm smiling really this is my smile right right dave huh yeah can you not tell i'm happy uh ooh. Uh, put on humility. Humility. Put on meekness, which is not what? You hear it said all the time. Huh? Weakness. Meekness is not weakness. What is meekness? Power, Power under control. control. Right. Put on long-suffering. Ring. Right. Put on forbearance. Or, I love the English language, forgiveness, and love. Put on love, right? Love is the height of all of those things. All right. Paul continues, or uh, Wiersbe rather, continues in talking about how God chose them, and he's elaborating. He says, This miracle of divine election did not depend on anything that we are or that we have done, for God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. You read that in Ephesians chapter 1. If God saved a sinner on the basis of merit or works, nobody would be saved. Amen? We don't really have to elaborate on that, right? All we have to do is sit and think about that for a little bit, and it should probably... It, I know it brings me to tears when I think about all the opportunities I've given God to cast me off, but He hasn't done it, right? It is all done through God's grace that it might all bring glory to Him. Of course, election is a sacred secret that belongs to God's children, and it is not a doctrine that we believers explain to the unsaved. Or it's not that we don't explain it to somebody who's not in Christ, but how in the world are they going to comprehend that, right? Huh? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but I really don't fully understand it either, right? But why would I try to pitch it to somebody who is not, who who is still dead in their sins and can't comprehend it? It just, there's no point, right? The Lord knoweth them that are His, Second Timothy 2.19. So we must leave the working out of His eternal purposes with Him. 
our task is to share the good news of the gospel with the lost world. Amen? Now, talking about God set them apart or set us apart, that is the meaning of the word holy. Remember? I don't know if you remember me talking about the root word or the root meaning of the word holy means what? Just like when you're making a stew and you're chopping up vegetables, what do you do after you chop up the vegetables? Set them apart, right? For what? For a good thing. Amen? That's what the root of the word holy means. So if we have been set apart, we've been set apart, set, cut away from what we were, set apart to what? Good. Something good in Christ. Amen? Because we have trusted Christ, we have been set apart from the world unto the Lord. We are not our own. We belong completely to Him. Just as the marriage ceremony sets apart a man and a woman for each other exclusively, so salvation sets the believer apart exclusively exclusively for Jesus Christ. Would it not be a horrible thing at the end of a wedding to see the groom run off with the maid of honor? It is just as horrible to contemplate the Christian living for the world and the flesh. That's hard to set apart, isn't it? Or it's hard to live in being set apart to Christ, isn't it? Uh, a lot of things have to change, right, in your life. Explain. It calls you to be set out and set apart. As me, as a follower of Jesus, I'm going to have to cut out a lot of things in my life. Okay? Like what? The Lord talks about me and who's one. Yeah. He'll spew you out of his mouth. For me, it's drinking filthy language and speak about it in the verse uh the verse eleven. Um I've had to change the way I talk in front of people. It's I have had a filthy mouth. But now it tastes like vinegar on my tongue. And I'm like, how did I walk around being that way? But to be set apart means to it's literally what you said. We're we're called out of something. Okay. We have to die to ourselves daily. It's not just a Oh, I'm a Christian now. God will cover the rest later. No, it's it's a daily conscious decision that I'm going to be set apart. That I have to deny myself daily. At least that's how I see it. Yeah, no, it's a grind for sure. And every day you get up and maybe have a new battle, or maybe you have an old battle that you hadn't quite worked through. Like you're talking about <clears throat> anger, right? You know, it's something that's probably going to rise up in you that day, and you and you beat it down again, right? Will he ever fully set you away from it or set you apart from it or take it away from you? I don't know. I know with drinking with alcohol for me, the Lord let me wallow around and, and flounder in it for years, man. Years. Uh, finally, he, he, you know, I still am not quite sure what exact lesson I learned out of it or the depth of the lesson I've learned from it. But I know that it wasn't me uh, that overcame it. It was him, uh, thankfully. Some things went away really quickly when I started walking with Christ. Uh, like language, for instance. When I was in the military and the army, the F word is like, yeah, it's, it's all the above. It's what people say when they're thinking, right? As their mind's running, they just throw out like every kind of form of the word you can think of, and then they start continuing in what they're saying, right? I learned that from all the leadership in the military. When I first got there, it was such a culture shock. Uh, if I'd have used that word around my daddy, he would have slapped me. But when I got to the army, it was like, I remember sitting in formation, standing there, listening to a drill sergeant, and he literally said it like a hundred times in like less than five minutes. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? But I picked it up from there. And then, and then uh, right before I really started walking with the Lord, that was something that I always said all the time. And, uh, but when I did start, the, the Spirit of God just, it was gone, man. That stuff just went away. But again, alcohol was not something that the Lord took away from me immediately. Some people He does, right? But, just like you said, it is a daily grind, right? Uh, let's see, where were we? God set them apart. Where I read that, right? Uh, God loves them, okay? When an unbeliever sins... He is a creature breaking the laws of the Holy Creator and Judge. But when a Christian sins, he is a child of God breaking the loving heart of his Father. Anybody feel that conviction? That you actually offended the Lord Himself? You guys comprehend that difference? 
Yeah. Well, I remember when, before I was actually walking with the Lord when I would do something wrong, I would just realize, ah, I know that's bad. I probably shouldn't do that, right? And if I hurt somebody or they really got ticked off at me, then I would feel pretty bad about it, right? But now, if I do something wrong, boy, the Holy Spirit lays over me like a wet blanket, you know, and that conviction is there. Anybody testify and understand the difference? You know what I'm talking about? Amen. Okay. But when a Christian sins, he's breaking the heart of his loving father. But love, or love is the strongest motivating power in the world. As the believer grows in his love for God, he will grow in his desire to obey him and walk in the newness of life that he has in Christ. God has forgiven you. Okay, Having forgiven you all trespasses, Colossians 2.13, God's forgiveness is complete and final. It is not conditional or partial. Amen? Right. Thankfully, right? What if it was? What if it was conditional or partial? The forgiveness. If it was conditional or partial. Right? How many times would you have gone from being God's grace to being uh, under the wrath while you were sitting in here in just the last 20 minutes? Right? So thankfully, it's one and done. Amen? Right. He's forgiven us. God's forgiveness is complete and final. It is not conditional or partial. How is the holy, how is the holy God able to forgive us guilty sinners? How? How is He able to stay just and graceful? Stay ju a just God who has to punish sin and yet gives us the grace and w gives us the in Jesus, what? Jesus did what? What did he? What did also? So he took the punishment for our sin. Who's what punishment? Where did it come from? Huh? No. Where did it come from? What? Whose punishment was it? Who was exacting the punishment? The Father, right? The Father was exacting the punishment. It was. We are saved from the wrath of God. Remember, right? Not necessarily from the punishment, but from Him Himself. <laughs> and He Himself became what? Became sin, right? And put Himself in that place of the Lamb to be punished, to be crushed. As Isaiah says, He literally crushed His own Son in our place. Okay, he took on the full wrath of God against us, against our sin, so that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. Amen. So uh, I'm gonna say amen. Bless you. Uh God is able to forgive us guilty sinners and still stay just because just like the sister said, because Christ stood in our place for us. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, Wiersbe says, God has forgiven us for Christ's sake and not for our own sake. We are chosen by God, set apart for God, loved by God, and forgiven by God. They all add up to grace. Now because of these gracious blessings, the Christian has some solemn responsibilities before God. Everybody get that? Okay. Everybody clearly understand that you don't just get to be forgiven and then you get to go on and live and do whatever you want to do, right? We have some responsibilities before a holy God. Amen? He must put on, or that is us, we must put on beautiful graces, the beautiful graces of the Christian life. Paul named eight graces. What are they? We must put on what? Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, Long suffering, forbearance, forgiveness, and love, right? Let's elaborate. Put on tender mercies, Paul says. The Greek uses the term bowels of compassion because the Greek people located the deeper emotions in the intestinal area while we locate them in the heart. As believers, we need to display tender feelings of compassion toward one another. This is not something that we turn on and off like the TV set. It is a constant attitude of heart that makes us easy to live with, right? 
in your own daily lives, in your own home with your spouse, uh, why would this be something that you should have? Why, why should tender mercies be something that you should always have on at all times? I don't know about you, but my mind goes, woo, like this all the time. And so do my emotions. Maybe it shouldn't. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm a little unstable. Right? I also know somebody in my life who is somewhat the same way. And if we are not having tender mercies upon ourselves, or we haven't already put on tender mercies, every time I look at your shoes, I think about pumpkin pie. Yeah. <laughs> see that? You see that? All right. I don't know where that would that would be. Uh, you guys need to be forbearing with me, okay? As I'm trying to teach this class, okay? Uh, if I didn't have tender mercy, if I didn't put on tender mercy, um, huh? So you are right though about the shoes. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, all right, shake the sillies out. Uh, why are tender mercies important? We'll just say within, between a, a, a husband and a wife. Why, why is it important? Big, big flaws, little flaws and big flaws. Yeah, I know he's going to do it again today. I'll just forbear. I'll be tender. Have mercy. Stupid shoes. <laughs> right? What else? I don't know if this is really what the same thing is. If y'all on the same page, y'all have one mindset, same you know, household, man, have the kids need to discipline. But if one parent is on high, one parent's on low, it's going to be a, a household's going to be not a broken, a broken household. Yeah. And a, bro, and a broken household, you know, they don't run together. It does. It's 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 everywhere. What does Christ say? A house divided can't what? It can't, it can't stand, right? right? Amen. Um. But what ha- So what happens if one's up and one's down? The one up and you know if if we're continuously having tender mercy, then it'll help level it out, right? Like we and get us each other back on the same page. Right. The kids see everything that the parents do. And it's like I always tell my son, it's, it's a cycle. If you want, if you want the cycle to, to not be broken, to to end its course, you know, you have to think one alike and act one alike. Yeah. Be, you can't like a punishment or discipline. You can't punish one day and then the same thing they do tomorrow or the next day. You just you don't don't let, let, let them to do the work that they want to do. They're gonna be like, well, if I get away with this day, then this, the next day, you know. I'm not going to be able to. Yeah. So you just got to be one, one little like, 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 mind it, like, like, mind it. Yeah. And we have to be consistent, right? That's hard, isn't it? <laughs> so I know it's hard for me. Uh, very good. Okay. So what else do you say to put on? Put on kindness, right? We have been saved because of God's kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. Amen. We, in turn, ought to show kindness towards others. He says, be ye kind one to another. Kind of along the same lines of what we were talking about. Next, he says, put on humbleness of mind, or in our form, we put humility here. The pagan world of Paul's day did not admire humility. Instead, they admired pride and domination. Jesus Christ is the greatest example of humbleness of mind. Humility is not thinking poorly of oneself. Rather, it is having the proper estimate of oneself in the will of God. The person with humbleness of mind thinks of others first and not himself. Again, another great quality to have as a spouse, right? I, I will openly admit, and probably until the day I die, that my wife thinks more of me than I think of her. More often, right? Uh, and about the kids, right? How she did, how she went to school for four years and uh, kept our house going, moving forward, 
with me staggering her along behind, still trying. I was trying to pick up the slack, but, you know, she's like, you know, ten times the person that I am, for sure. Uh, how she did it, you know, I don't know. The Lord made her that way, and the Lord gave her a lot of grace because He knew that I needed it, right? Uh, because now I'm in the midst of trying to study and do these things uh, kind of like she was. And uh, it was crazy. But at the same time, she was all she was still thinking of others before herself. Uh, and she was being probably the best example of, that I've seen of how we ought to be towards each other, right? Having humility. Amen? Anybody want to add anything there? All right, put on meekness, he says. Meekness is not what? Meekness is not weakness. It is power under control. This word was used to describe a soothing wind, a healing medicine, and a cult that had been broken. In each instance, there is power. A wind can become a storm. Too much medicine can kill, and a horse can break loose. But this power is under control. The meek person does not have to fly off the handle because he has everything under control. Right? Because you don't break everybody's neck with one hand. You, that's meekness, right? You could, but but you don't, right? At least you, you're not letting people know that you do, right? You're ha hiding it very well, right? <laughs> Put on long suffering, he says. This word is literally long temper, okay? The short tempered person speaks and acts impulsively and lacks self control. Anybody have an example of that? Well, no, not Being, huh? She puts up with me. I'm short tempered. She's not. She put up with me for a long time. That's, that's probably one of the greatest examples of long suffering I've ever seen. I put her through the ringer. What's your. What's your <laughs> About where is he now? He's maybe 75, 80%? 80? Oh, she, let's see. She could have said 73, and I was saying 75. She gave me an 80. That's pretty good. That's good. Long suffering. Don't be short tempered. A short tempered person <laughs> speaks and acts impulsively and lacks self control. Who in the Bible was like that? Who, who, huh? Peter, right. He always entered the room with his mouth first, right? When a person is long-suffering, he can put up with provoking people or circumstances without retaliating. It is good to be able to get angry, for this is a sign of holy character. Okay, again, it's not a sin to be angry, right? Remember, Jesus said, be angry and do not what? Don't sin, okay? Wiersbe writes it, It is good to be able to get angry, for this is a sign of holy character, but it is wrong to get angry quickly at the wrong things and for the wrong reasons. Okay? Six, he says, put on forbearance. This word literally means to hold up or to hold back. God is forbearing towards sinners in that he holds back his judgment. Meekness, long suffering, and forgiveness go together. Okay, all those things. We understand how they're almost like a, a braided. Uh, a braid, right? You got three pieces and you braid it together. <clears throat> and then he says, put on forgiveness. This is the logical result of all that Paul has written so far in this section. It is not enough that the Christian must endure grief and provocation and refuse to retaliate. He must also forgive the troublemaker. Okay? Let's think through that again. It is not enough that the Christian must endure grief and provocation. Right, some of us might be right here in the midst of this process. We were able to endure grief and provocation, right, and we refuse to retaliate. But are we able to step farther into that forgiveness? Right? Anybody have a problem with that? I don't have an issue with, with uh, you know, not breaking your neck when you really deserve it, and being long suffering with you, right? But I'm not quite ready to forgive you yet. Right? You? Right, so moving into forgiveness, okay? He must also forgive the troublemaker. If he does not, then feelings of malice will develop in the heart, 
and these can lead to greater sins, right? What is, what, in another part of the word, he says what? Don't let a root of what? A root of bitterness take hold, right? What happens? Or why, where does that come from? From not, we're not forgiving for, for, yeah. Then he says, put on love. This is the most important of the Christian virtues, and it acts like a girdle that ties all the other virtues together. All the spiritual qualities Paul has named are aspects of true Christian love, as a reading of 1 Corinthians 13 will reveal. Love is the first of the fruit of the Spirit, and the other virtues follow, like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When love rules in our lives, it unites all these spiritual virtues so that there is beauty and harmony indicating spiritual maturity. This harmony and maturity keep the life balanced and growing. The Gnostic system could never do this. Okay, Practical application of what God wants us to do. What In the end, what are we actually doing? We are conforming or being conformed by the renewing of our mind to the image of Christ. Right? as opposed to the image of the dead man before, where we were angry with each other, we couldn't forgive each other, uh, we had filthy language, we had filthy minds, right? We uh, came up with all sorts of stupid ideas and things, right? We put off those things, and now we put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, forgiveness, and love. Amen? Motivated. Dedicated. Motivated to become more the image of Christ. By what? The grace of Christ, the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and the name of Christ. Elaboration. Anybody got anything? Crowley, you got anything? What is the greatest takeaway from this lesson today? Anybody see anything that they need to uh, step it up on? Anybody jump out at anything? Jump out at anybody? Good, good. I think forgiveness is is for me. It's one thing if the person stops doing the thing, but when it continues, and it's and it's been long suffering and forbearing for a long time, and then like the, that's when the forgiveness gets hard. I feel like when so would that would that mean that your forgiveness was conditional and the condition is I forgive you about 90% right now if you quit then then I'll give you that other 10 yeah right uh, so Right. So your life was going along, they did something here, you forgave them, you forgave them here, right? But they continue on, and here you find it still hard to forgive them. Did you actually forgive them back here? You thought you did, huh? Right? Just something to think about. Amen? Good. Anybody else in her boat? Yep, still there? Anger? Anger? Amen. Anything else? Yeah. That's a big, big number for me. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> amen. Uh, I know where you're at. Um, one of these guys, 
uh, that showed up. I don't know if you guys were here last time when we were talking about it, but he has a partner, right, and not a wife. And he showed up to the to the dinner for everybody, all the new recruits, with his partner, right. And uh, I, there's something about uh, homosexuality that I don't, I don't know, man. It is rough for me to uh, to have compassion towards towards that towards people who are just blatantly out there like that, you know? And so that's something that I, you know, I know I'm supposed to, but at the same time, I, I, I genuinely have this righteous indignation towards it. And I, I haven't quite, well, just say that I, I know that I'm not as loving towards people like that as I should be. Right. Uh, could be a stem from, uh, being molested as a child, right? Um, or not? I don't really know. But anyway, but now, and I prayed and asked the Lord to help me be a light in all their all their lives, especially His life. And now He dropped out of the academy; He's not there. So that was what the Lord's will was. Anyway, very good things. Put off the old man. Put on these new things. Right? Remember, it's a once and for all thing to putting off those those things and putting on these. Amen. Pray for us. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We uh, pray for all the prayer requests petitioned earlier in class. Uh, pray that we go into church service with an open and humble heart. Pray that you direct our day and our path. Amen. Amen. You got a bookmark?